Welcome to the Amity Bible Church with our senior pastor, George Martin Jr. If you're a first time guest here in person or if you're viewing online, we want to thank you for joining us. You may or may not know, but Pastor Martin is inside of an important sermon series. It's dealing with prayer, entitled God's House, a House of Prayer. Today's message is How Then Shall We Pray? Because many times as believers, prayer is difficult, and other times we're too shy to pray out loud. Pastor Martin tackles these issues and more, and you can prepare for the word in your Bibles or your Bible app in Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. And as you know, our vision is to become the church that Christ intended it to be. To know God and to make him known is our mission, and we are committed to loving God, serving others, and are unashamedly obsessed with sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. The service is always broadcast on our YouTube and Facebook page, so you can always go there to get caught up. While you're there, like and subscribe, and don't forget our Instagram. We greatly appreciate it. All right, it's time for some praise and worship. Time to give God the glory. We're going to kick things off the right way. So stand to your feet and put your hands together for the Amity Adult Choir. Good morning, Amity. Good morning. I love the Lord with all of my heart. I wonder if anybody in here loves him with all of your heart, all of your mind, and all of your soul. And this is just a simple song to tell him how much we love him. Amen.
no one like the Lord. The Lord is holy. There is no one holy like God. There is no one beside you, Lord. You are our rock. And holy means that he's righteous. He's set apart. He's pure. There's nobody. And because of that, he deserves all of the glory. He deserves all of the worship. He deserves everything that we give him. Holy are you, Lord. Holy. And only one word comes to mind. There's only one word to describe. And only one word comes to mind. There's only
morning, Amity Bible Church. I am George Martin III, and I am excited to welcome all stewards, guests, and friends joining us our service this Sunday morning. If this is your first time visiting or viewing with us, we invite you to connect by texting WELCOME to 469-270-5517. Each week, we remind ourselves of what our Lord and Savior commanded through our congregational scriptures found in John chapter 13, verses 44 through 35. Please join me in reciting these scriptures. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Please join me in prayer. God, we thank you this morning. We pray that this service will be the best service that we've had ever in this church named Amity Bible Church. We pray that you will just give anyone in this service that needs healing or prayer, that you will strengthen them and that they will be able to just be at rest and they will be healed by your almighty glory, Lord. And that we pray that you will just make sure that Pastor Martin will be able to recite his sermon correctly and that there will be no technical difficulties and that everyone will be able to be enlightened by this. In Jesus' name, amen. this time, we want to acknowledge each other in Christian fellowship. Let's greet each other. means friendship and we hope you all enjoy this time of friendly fellowship have a fantastic sunday and enjoy the rest of the service
When you've done all you can, man, seems like it's never enough. And what do you say when your friends turn away and you're all alone, all alone? Child 
is great. And I faced the situation where the parent blamed me for her child's passing. Yeah. It hurts when they come and they tell you they're hurting and you know that it's not anything you've done, but still it comes your way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But in the midst of all that, one thing was certain for me. There was nothing I could do. All I could do was stand. So I need you to understand that. You need to understand this. After you've done all you can. don't you've done all you know to do and you feel like you've exhausted every avenue every means that you are aware of the song says after you've done all you can stand And before Paul says that, he says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So the reality is that I can only stand, God, if you give me the power and the strength to stand. The song was prophetic for me because you all have not been aware, but since November, I've been in a tremendous spiritual warfare. Attacks against my character. Attacks against who I am as a man and as a man of God. Up nights, wrestling in prayer up early, wrestling in prayer. And I got to a point where I felt like I was exhausted to the point that I had nothing left. And literally God said, after you've done all you can. Yeah. 
after you've done all you can, stand. After you've done all you can and it still ain't enough, stand. And I tell you what, that was a sure foundation to stand on. Because if God ever tells you to stand, he will give you the strength to stand. And I don't know if there's anybody here today that you had to stand when you felt like laying down. You felt like crawling off the scene, but God said, don't crawl out. I got you. Stand. So I thank God for his goodness. I thank God for his grace. I thank God for his mercy. I thank God for his faithfulness and the power to stand. Because if it had not been for the Lord, and I want you to testify today, find somebody around you. I'm not going to tell you to touch a neighbor, just find somebody and say, if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, after this one. Get your stand ready. After you've done all you can, you just, you just stand. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to God. Listen, we are so grateful today for his goodness. While we're standing, while you're standing, I want to pause for a moment to pray. And I want us to pray for what's happening in the Middle East. I'd admonish you as a believer to pray. Certainly the word tells us in Psalm 122 to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And that's not to pray for its victory, pray for its peace. And the reality is that Jesus says in the days that will precede his return, there will be wars and rumors of war. I admonish your prayer today for the Middle East because we stand on the brink of World War III. I say that because beyond the conflict between a group of people in Gaza Hamas and a nation, now what we have is we have two nations battling, that is Iran and Israel. And we have a third nation who's standing in as an ally, and that is the United States. The reality is, is that if a, an additional ally steps in to this conflict, it is the groundwork for a world war. So as we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, let's play, pray for the governments and those who are in charge. Because Paul says in his first letter to Timothy in the second chapter, he says that we as the believers should pray for kings and those in authority that we may live a quiet and peaceable life. 
we recognize that none of us know all the details of the political agendas that have generated all that we're seeing escalated. But we can call out to the great King of Kings. Yes. Because the word says that the king's heart is in the, in the hands of the Lord. And just like a river, he can steer it whichever way he chooses. So we're, as we pause now to pray, you prayer warriors, you, you believers, you children of the Most High God, let's ask God to bring peace out of the confusion. Let's ask him to move in a special way. Because we're, as I said, on the brink of a global battle. And the reality is it will be like no other if that be the case. Because in previous years, the technology and the reality of how war happens has advanced multiple generations since World War II. And the catastrophic nature of what nature of what could take place could be devastating in a way that never have been seen before. Would you pray with me? Yes. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. Because God, as we've already been reminded through this song that, Lord, you speak to our hearts and you are there to remind us that we can stand in difficult times. And so right now, God, we stand together in prayer, lifting up the matters that concern the Middle East. Lord, we understand that in the midst of all that's going on, there are things that we know not of. There are plans and agendas that are set forth. There's objectives that are intended to be met. But in the midst of all that we're facing right now, we recognize that, God, you are still in control. So, Father, we ask, as you told us and instructed us in your word, to pray for kings and rulers and governments that are in authority. God, and we are praying because we desire, God, to live quiet and peaceable lives. So we ask, God, that you would move and that you'd guide and direct. We pray because we know that your word says that the king's heart, the leader's heart, is in your hand. And as a river, you're able to steer it whichever way you choose. So, God, we pray that you would steer it away. Steer it away, God, that there may be resolution where there was once impending conflict. May there be a de-escalation where there has been escalation. And Father, may the hearts of those be mindful of the decisions that are made. Hearts of those who make decisions on behalf of millions, God. We realize that now these decisions won't just affect millions, but potentially billions across the planet. And God, we ask, may your grace be sufficient and may your mercy endure, and may your power reign. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. While you're standing, grab your Bibles. We're going to continue on our journey uh, in this sermon series, God's House, a House of Prayer. And this week we want to, our sermon title is entitled, How Then Shall We Pray? I'll invite you to the Gospel of St. Luke today, and we'll look at verses 1 through 4. St. Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. Now, it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place when he ceased, that one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. So he said to them, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day by, give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone who's indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. You may be seated. Deliver us from the evil one. Amen? Amen? We know if the enemy has his way, he creates utter and total chaos. But our God is a God of peace who brings about unity. Amen? Amen. 
This passage of scripture we're often, we're very familiar with, and I'm not going to, because our focal point today will not be on how to dissect this particular text, but it's it, it, as far as Jesus prescribes, and we're going to list those things and give context for what he does here, because oftentimes this passage, this passage and others that are recorded in the Gospels are recited or rehearsed back. But ultimately what Jesus is doing is actually giving you a prescription. Remember, they asked him, teach us how to pray. And so he gives them a model or he gives them some elements that should be included in their prayer. So we're going to highlight what those are, but our focal point will be uh, to, to, to hone in on something that as he says, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And then as the word goes on to say that we as believers should pray always, I'm going to focus on helping us to understand here are some things that the Bible gives us collectively and individually that we can pray when we run out of things to ask. Because here's what happens. Uh, most times we spend most of our prayer times asking for our stuff. Amen. Let's just be honest. Come on. It's your daddy, so you go to like, like a child to a daddy. My kids come to me, they, they ask me for stuff. And that's how we go to God. God, give me, 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 God, give me, God, give me, God, give me, right? So, so ultimately, we do know how to ask for stuff for us. So our time today will be in enlisting some things from Scripture that when we think about a praying church that is praying always and intentional about prayer, that, hey, here's a list, and it's not an exhaustive list, but it's a list that helps you to understand that when you are praying and you run out of your list of, 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 of items you want, you say, well, Lord, I, I planned on praying for 15 minutes, and then the first three, I've gotten all my stuff out. What do I pray then? Amen? So today what we're going to do is because when we look at this, the, the, the disciples had become acquainted or accustomed to seeing Jesus always praying. And now they saw that this intimacy that he had, so they said, Lord, teach us how John, teach us to pray like John taught his, his servants to pray or his disciples to pray. And so Jesus is, is responding to them because their, their question was, teach us to pray. That's their request. So what we find is that because if God says, my house shall be called a house of prayer, and watch this now, the Bible says that God is not necessarily just interested in dwelling in structures. He wants to dwell in you. Then that makes you a house of God, and that house should be a house that's praying. Oh, you missed it. Because here's what Paul says, know you not that your body, you are the temple of God. And the Spirit of God dwells. God wants, yes, we have places where he sanctified his name and it plays his name, where we come to gather and worship, but ultimately he dwells in you. So that also includes you should be a house of prayer. So the reality of our journey today is there's a couple questions that we're, we're going to answer that will set the parameters for our study today. The first question was, is in the title, how then shall we pray? And the second question is, what then shall we pray? So the sermon will be in two parts. The first part, I'll respond to how because Jesus prescribes that for us in this text, and we can see that. So we'll, we'll, we'll walk through that and understand what that means, and then we'll move on to question number two, then what then shall we pray? And this is not intended to tell you everything you should pray, but it is to give you some things that God gives in his word for us to pray. Amen? Amen. Here we go. So first question, how then shall we pray? If we look at the text, we see that Jesus shows us, hey, that ultimately prayer is intended to be a conversation with your personal father. He says in, in the first verse, he says, when you're praying, he says, you should say our father. Because prayer is a conversation with your heavenly father. 
The question is, how often is your conversations with your Heavenly Father one-sided? Now, you know yourself, you get offended when somebody won't let you speak. You didn't say it just week. You just keep cutting me off. <laughs> so prayer is not just me coming and speaking at God about what I concerns me, but it's an, also an opportunity for me to pause for a moment and listen to let him speak back to me. Because a conversation relationship with teaching this, conversation is two-way. There is some speaking and there's some listening. Then the next thing he says you need to do is that when you come to God, you must acknowledge that he says, hallowed be thy name, that we must recognize that it is a privilege to even be able to approach a holy God. See, sometimes we don't stop to reverence the fact that we're talking to the king. Yes, he's your father, but he is the king of all creation. So he says, make sure when you come and talk to him, you reverence who he is. Bothers me sometimes because sometimes we approach prayer kind of like kicking the door in. So, you know, before Christ came and took the veil down, the veil split while he was on the cross as he was removing the veil because before you could only go into the holies of holy, there was a veil between God and man. And he only allowed the, the, the high priest every so often to come into that holies of holies. But, but when Jesus died, because now he says, when you go to God the Father, the Holy One of all, you're going to come through me, that I will, be your, I will be the means by which you will go to him. But when we are not reverential about prayer, it's like walking up and just kicking the door in. God, I'm here. And yes, we are, we are allowed to come to him Boldly, with confidence, but bold don't mean disrespectful. Uh, here's how it works. Your child can, can, can boldly stand up and be courageous to try to communicate how they feel. But how you express how you feel, son, because you're going to feel something else <laughs> if you don't correct how you're coming, right? So, so, so what, we can come with boldness and confidence to him, but you still got to recognize who you're talking to. So he says, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Recognize who you're talking to. He ain't to be played with. Amen? Look at the next one. He says, your kingdom come, your will be done. He says a part of our prayer should not just be about us. It should also include our desire to see the advancement of God's kingdom in the earth. Do you understand that if more people come to know Jesus, they stop doing the things that make the 6 o'clock news? Do you realize if all the bloods got saved, they would not be fighting for the blood, they'd be living under the blood. So the reality is, he says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We should not just come for ourselves, but God, help those who need you to find you. Then he says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Here's what this is. In heaven, there's nothing that happens that is not in God's will. An angel don't fly. He don't speak. He don't walk. He don't do anything unless it's in order with God's will. But we know that in the earth so much is happening that God don't like, right? Right? As they say, God don't like ugly. We see a whole lot of ugly, don't we? So he says we should be praying, 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That God save, touch, bless, so that men will recognize that they do have a will, but their will should be surrendered and submitted to your will. But watch this now, that we also pause for a minute and ask the question, is what I'm asking for according to your will? Now, let me say this. I know that when we talk about the will of God, it's it's oftentimes challenging to figure out what God's will is, right? But some things are evident. Some things are just evident. Let me help you with one, and hopefully this, this helps you. So, so some years ago, I was praying with some, a sister trying to help her. She said, Pastor, I just feel so discouraged. I was believing, talking about preaching on faith, and, and I just believe in God. And I kept believing God to do this thing, and he didn't do it, and my heart is broken because I feel like God don't answer prayer. Brother Kelvin, I had to investigate further. When I investigated further, I found out she was praying for me to be her husband. I know that ain't God's will. <laughs> I could have helped you with that when you started that prayer. (laughs) So some things are very clearly not God's will, right? Other things we're saying, God, I I, I want to please you. I want your will to be done. And, And it's in that that we recognize that we come to him and make sure that what we're asking for does not contradict his word. That's your starting point. You praying for, some, for God to kill somebody that hurt you that ain't in the Bible. So he ain't doing that. Because he says, pray for them who despitefully use you. He said, love the enemy. Because you've been praying for haters. God, get rid of my haters. That's why they still flourishing, because God said, that ain't my will. (laughs) So there's some things that are evident, other things are not, but it's in us praying. But here's, let me help you with this. But just know this, that Paul says that even when you miss the mark, Romans chapter 8, Paul says that the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us because we don't know what to pray for as we are. Sometimes you pray some stuff, God said, you know, if I really did that, I'd have to, you know what, I ain't going to, the Holy Spirit said, no, that ain't, that ain't, that that she, she heard right now, he going through a difficult time. Excuse that one. Lord, I'm just tired of going through, just take me now. Holy Spirit, that ain't what he mean. <laughs> he, just, he, he just wants some relief, God. So we have this advocate, this intercessor for us, the Holy Spirit who takes what we're saying and makes it presentable to heaven. Isn't that good news? Because sometimes you may miss the mark in what you're praying, but God said, I already got your help in your help. You missed it. I've got your help in your help. I put the Holy Spirit, you praying, and that is your help. But I got some help in your help. While you're praying, the Holy Spirit said, okay, let's see. No, no, that's not it. Here's what it is. And it still makes it to the throne. Amen. Then he says, and here's where, now, now after all of this, this is where you get to your opportunity to start talking about your stuff. He says, now give us day by day our daily bread. That is all your stuff. Bread bread speaks of provision, speaks of God giving to his children the good gifts that he has for them. The bread, give us our daily bread. He says, every day you can come and say, God, I need you to help me, right? But he says, this is after you've acknowledged that he is a good father, that he's a holy God, that you've, you've, you've taken a moment to consider that there are other things that he may have as a part of his will and his plan, and now you place those things there. Why? Because you got the Holy Spirit helping you. 
Because even if you start asking stuff, I don't know how the Lord interceded with the sister praying for me to be a husband. I don't know what the Holy Spirit did with what she was praying for, but it, it, yeah, he, he didn't have to get in on that, I don't think. He's just like, you know, okay. Daughter, trust God. Give us this day our daily bread. And then he moves into this part. And forgive us our sins. So praying should often include, Lord, forgive me for anything that I've said or done that intended to do that's not pleasing to you. And here's something I always try to put in mind. I said, God, and forgive me for anything that would hinder you from receiving me as I come. Because there are things that I know and things that I don't know. And so because I know there's some don't knows, I'm going to ask God, whatever it may be, forgive me. But here, then he puts a responsibility on us because then he says, forgive us. In the same way that we've forgiven. Forgive us as we have forgiven others. Ooh, that gets tough, doesn't it? Because I ain't ready to forgive them yet, God, but I need you to forgive me today. But here's what he's really saying. He says, you cannot forgive anyone if you're not postured to forgive them. Let me help you understand this. You may not be ready to forgive them, but you got to have some intentions to. It works like this. If 75 takes you from here to Allen, you got to get on 75. Now, you may get on there and park, <laughs> but you still got to be on it. What I mean by park is that you may say, hey, I can't forgive. I'm still struggling, I, 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 but I plan to. My heart is set on forgiving because I know, God, you told me to forgive. And right now, I'm working through my hurt. I'm working through my pain. I'm working through my frustration. But in the midst of how I'm feeling, I recognize that you said I must forgive as you forgive me. Amen? Amen. Because some things are hurtful, and there are multiple layers to it. Sometimes you've been able to forgive in some area of whatever the situation is, and you're still working for the grace for the rest of it, but you've got to be on the road. Keep that in mind. You got to be on the road to forgiveness, even if you're not going as fast as others. Because you may be out there on seven, you might be on, 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 on a forgiveness highway just barely, just barely touching the pedal. But I promise you, you're not going unless you're on the road. Amen? I've spent way too much time on this part, but I just felt like I need to teach this out. But let's, let's, okay, let's go on. Here we go. Let's go. Here we go. And then he says, lead us not into temptation. That's what we're praying for, guidance and direction. God, give me direction. Help me to understand. Help me to know which decision to make. Uh, I've got a great, a big opportunity. I want to make sure that I'm making the right choice. He says, lead us not into temptation. And then he says, deliver us from the evil one. That is his deliverance and his protection. God, keep us and protect us. Watch over us because I know that you are our keeper. So we see that Jesus tells them, he gives them this model and he helps them understand, hey, when you're praying, you want to include these things. So now let me move into the, my next question because this is where I want to spend the balance of my time. And this is when I, I want to share some things with you that I hope will help to inspire you and help you to understand because if we're going to be a praying church, these are things that the Bible gives us as specific things to pray for. The first thing, he said, so we, we should pray for uh, hearts that seek the lost. And we should pray for hearts that want to serve God in his kingdom. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 through 38, it reads like this. It says, but when he saw the multitudes, because not watch this now, this is Jesus' heart being revealed. 
when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and they were scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Here's the reality. You are walking among people every day, all day, on your job, at the store, in the Walmart, on your walk, your, your, your exercise at the gym. You are walking among people who are scattered and are like sheep with no shepherd. And when Jesus saw it, it says it moved him with compassion. Then look what he says in verse 30. Then he said to his disciples, his followers, after Jesus' heart was touched for those who were lost, he then started talking to the disciples. He says to the disciples, the harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Here's the prayer request. He says, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send laborers in the vineyard or his vineyard, that he would stir up in us this heart for the lost as he has a heart for the lost. And that more of us would have this sensitivity to the lostness that, are, that is around us. Because in that you see hearts to serve because he says send forth laborers. And you see hearts for the lost because he says the harvest it's plentiful. And he wanted them to look out and see. See, they saw a crowd of people. Here's what you need to understand. They saw a crowd of people who was gathering around, and some of them were gathering because of Jesus, because of his fame. He says, but the harvest is plentiful. There's plenty of people who need the Lord. And God wants us to have the same heart that Jesus saw. When he saw a crowd, you should see all the people who don't know him. The next thing, that we should pray for the gospel to spread across the whole earth. That you should pray that we as believers should pray that the gospel goes all over the world. Here's what Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1, he said this way. He says, finally, brethren, brethren refers to believers. He says, and he's speaking, this, this letter he's writing to the church at Thessalonica. So he's speaking to the believers. He says, finally, brethren, pray for us, meaning that they were, they were on the mission field taking the gospel around. He says, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it was with you. He says, just as you heard the gospel and came to hear to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, he said, you should pray for others that the gospel will reach other people all over the, the planet. So pray for the gospel to spread across the earth. Here's another one. He says that we should pray for boldness to share the gospel. In the fourth chapter of Acts, there is a tremendous example. When you have a chance, I would encourage you to read it because what's happening is the church is blossoming, but there is this, this persecution that is happening against the church. And so then because the persecution is creating fear and anxiousness about continuing to share the good news, the church stops for a while and they begin to pray, and here's what their prayer request was. In Acts chapter 4, verse 29, here's what they pray for. They say, and now look upon their threats. So there was a threat, there were threats against their lives. See, we can share the good, the good news without anybody coming in and kicking our door at, at, at 2 o'clock in the morning, right? But he said, but they were under duress, and they said, now look on their threats and grant your servants that with all boldness, they may continue to speak your word. He said, listen, we should be praying. God, let's say you, you, you get, I am not a person 
who is naturally outgoing. It is through my calling that I'm more outgoing. But my personal preference is not to talk <laughs> to people very much. Now, that wouldn't make much of a call if I didn't do that. Just walk around, hey, Pastor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How was your week? It was good. <laughs> so the idea of approaching people to talk is a big deal for me. Now, this woman that God gave me, any and everybody. <laughs> hey, how you doing? Hey, 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 how you doing? Hey, you, hey, 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 hey. We're coming back. We're in the airport. We're waiting. We had a layover. I'm sitting in there. I said, okay, you know, I went to the bathroom. I came back. I said, children, where's your mother? They said, oh, we don't know. We thought she was with you. I said, no, she wasn't. I went to the bathroom. So we're hunting around. I said, God, we're in this airport. Somebody took my wife. <laughs> Trying to not, I don't want the kids to get alarmed, you know. They, they, so, so I'm looking around. And I look over. She's sitting at a table <laughs> with five people and three standing around them that I have no idea who they are. <laughs> She's smiling and talking, and, and so when she comes back and said, honey, who are those folks? Oh, they were, they, they were on the cruise. That's Miss Bessie, because she's got, that's Miss Bessie, she got her own travel agency, and, and Donnie just had certain, you're talking about these people like you know them. <laughs> So I'm not naturally that person that's willing to just talk to people about things unless it's something that's very easy. And you may be in that boat as well, where you say, God, I know I'm supposed to share with my neighbor about you. I know I'm supposed, and here's, here, let me share this with you. God is not calling you to go and chase after total strangers. Let me just help you with this. If I don't know you, why should I trust what you have to say? You come to tell me something's good news, I don't know you. Just because you got a Bible don't mean nothing to me, right? So who is he calling you to? People who know who you are and know what God is doing in your life. They are the ones that are trust that if you're telling them something good, that it must be worth listening to. Amen. But it still requires us, if we feel intimidated, to as the church prayed in Acts 4, Lord, grant us boldness to speak your word. So we should be praying for boldness to share the gospel with others. Here's another one. In that same fourth chapter of Acts, there's another prayer request we see. Pray for the witness of God's power to support the gospel. Because oftentimes people are listening and they say, you're saying that, 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 that there's this great power in Jesus Christ. So... They went on after they asked for boldness in that same prayer. Look at the rest of their prayer in verse 30 and 31. He, they said, give us boldness. This is but also by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And that they, and they prayed and that place where they were were assembled and began to shake and the Holy Spirit filled them. They were so strengthened that they were bold and ready to go forward. But their request was, God, do some things that confound men that they might witness and testify to who you are. I want to do this real quick. Uh, today we got Brother Lincoln Hay with us today. <laughs> There he is. Wave your hand, Brother Lincoln. Just about a month and a half ago, he had a stroke that, uh, that, that, that put him 
down. But he's here today. So stretch forth your hand, God, to prove that you are still working in the earth, that when we share the good news to somebody, we can say, I know God is real. I know he's alive and well because he's still working in his life and he's still doing great things and he will do something great for you if you accept him as your savior. So we pray for God's power to be revealed to support the gospel. The gospel is the truth. The truth is what sets us free. But when God works with the gospel by performing great things, then it proves that he is who he says he is, and he does what he says he would do. Amen? Amen. All right, I'm almost done. Yep, almost done. Here's another one. We should pray for the persecuted church. We freely come and worship without any stress or strain. And that liberty should remind us that we have brothers and sisters all over the globe that can't just come and into their church and worship. Many don't have a place to go. They have to be strategic. They have to be crafty in, in how they share where they're going to get together. So every time you pull up and you can just walk right in and ain't nobody standing outside the door with a guard and saying, do you love Jesus? Yeah. It's a remind us to pray for the persecuted church. And, and, and we have instructions from the writer of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 3, he says this. He says, remember those that are in prison and in chains as though you're in chains with them. Those who are mistreated, that's it since you yourselves are in the body also. He says, pray for those that are a part of the body of Christ who suffer for the name of Jesus. There are some places today in this world that just by saying the name of Jesus, you can be beaten. That ought to make us want to say it all the more, right? <laughs> Jesus, 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 Jesus. Because of the gratitude that we have the liberty to do so but it should compel us to pray for our brothers and sisters. I almost done. Pray, pray for one another. So when you run out of things on your list of what you should pray for, start praying for your brothers and sisters. You want a Cadillac, pray for somebody to get one. You reap what you sow. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, it says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication for this in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. There's always somebody who's in need of prayer. So as you're working through your list and you're done with what you've offered to the Lord, he says, then there are others that you can pray for and ask God to touch them. Then, then here's another thing that Paul says that we should pray for. Pray for the boldness of, of pastors to preach the gospel boldly. Because here's what Paul says. In the last days, men will heap up teachers that will help scratch their itching ears to not preach the gospel but preach fables. And, and he even describes some of it as doctrines of demons. Pray for pastors to preach the gospel boldly. In that same sixth chapter of Ephesians, verse 19, the very next verse, he says, and, and then Paul says, and pray for me that the utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mysteries of the gospel. See, popularity, um, popularity and pursuit of which has taken front stage in certain cases or center stage where the gospel is supposed to be proclaimed. You can flock numbers if you only give out sweets.
But the gospel is not just sweet. See, the, the gospel starts out pretty negative. It says the wages of sin is death. See, we don't, we don't talk about sin that much anymore. Well, you're fine. You're blessed and highly favored of the Lord. God said he'll make you the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. But what about come out from among them? Because as we want to know about our best life, do you realize your best life is a Christ life? Not a one where you indulge in every possible whim of desire and lust that you have. Girl, you only live once. No, that's not true. Don't, 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 don't buy that one. That, 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 put that back on the shelf. So pray for boldness that pastors will preach the gospel with boldness. Then we should pray for the strength and help and faithfulness of pastors and church leaders because the enemy always recognizes that if it comes after heads, then it affects all those that are following. In Thessalonians, the second letter to the Thessalonica church, Paul says this in chapter 3, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 2. He says, and we may be, pray for us that we, so he, he said, he said, pray, but he says, pray for us that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. So he said, hey, pray that God will strengthen and encourage. Uh, there was a statistic that was speaking of the number of pastors that are leaving the gospel or leaving the, the, uh, the ministry. Um, recently, I, was in, I encountered a gentleman who... Um, is, is his pursuit of another career, pastored, went through a great turmoil, and just said, you know what, I'm going to leave that behind. So the reality is, is that we should pray for pastors and leaders, not just because there's some of us that have led in high levels in our church before, and we said, boy, I saw all that. I don't want to do nothing like that no more. <laughs> but God needs great leaders and great pastors to lead. Amen? Amen. We're almost done. Pray for those throughout the world because no matter where someone is, God desires for them to be saved. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, he says, Therefore I exhort first of all that supplications and prayers and intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men, no matter where they are. God, we want men and women to know who you are that goes back to the, the request for the gospel to spread. We pray for the gospel to spread and that they'll be prepared to receive it. Here we go, last couple. Pray for wisdom and, de and discernment, that we should all pray. God, give us wisdom. Make us wise that we don't continue to follow the same patterns and do the same things. James chapter 1 and verse 5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives it. Give it to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. He says, so we should pray for wisdom and discernment to know that we make the right decisions in these last days. And then this last one, and I'm going to we'll be done. Pray for our, our watchfulness for the Lord's return. Believers should be always ever watching for the sky to part because Jesus says, I'm going away to prepare a place for you, and I will come again. If we become too earthly concerned, we are no longer heaven. We begin to lessen our expectation of heaven. Peter addresses this in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. He says, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Pray that we remain watchful for Christ's return because otherwise 
we, be, we lose sight of the big picture. That the only reason that he hasn't come back yet is because God is not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. And we're praying for the gospel to share it and, and be shared and spread. And therefore, we should always be watching for his return. Romans chapter 13 and 11, and I'm done. And do this knowing that the time that now is high time, to awake out of our slumber or our sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Do you realize that the, the closer that you're approaching something, it becomes nearer to you? When you first came to know Jesus Christ, whatever day that was, the next day you were closer to his return. And so he says, be mindful and watchful because our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. So we should pray for, to remain watchful for his return. Send to your feet. The, re the reality that we have today is that Jesus' return is nearer than when he first left. And the reality is that someone here, God has been speaking to your heart and he's been drawing you to himself and he's saying to you, it's time. It's time for you to surrender your life to me. The reason I say that is because Jesus said that no man can come to me unless my Father is first drawing him. So then that tells me that before a person makes the decision to accept Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, that before that moment that you do that, God has been saying to you, come. And I believe today there's someone here that God has been saying to you, come. That now is the time for you to make the decision to turn over the reins of your life, the reins of your heart, to turn those over to Jesus. And he says it this way, he says, come unto me. All you who are laboring and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. You've been trying to navigate life and figure life out on your own, but he says, I've already got it figured out. If you just come to me, he says, because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And then he says this, he says, if you come to him, he says, I'll teach you. The beauty and blessing of knowing Jesus is that after you accept him as your Savior, he puts his Holy Spirit in you, and the Holy Spirit helps you with the navigation. We, I shared earlier how the Holy Spirit even helps to intercess for you as you pray, that you don't know how to pray. You feel like it's intimidating to pray, but I, he will even help you in your prayer time. But it starts with you making the decision to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. If you're here today and you've never made the decision to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, but you sense God tugging at your heart right now, would you come? Would you come? Thank you, Jesus. 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 Let me just share this with you. We, we're rejoicing because Karen had been going through a very difficult time. And so the prayer request came to the worship ministry one Sunday morning about two months ago. And we just began praying for her. Lord, help her through this difficult time. And she wanted to be here in worship today. And she came and she thanked the worship ministry for, for praying for her and praying over her. So to see her respond to God today, come on, let's give God a hand blessing. Today was her day. Is there someone today, someone else that's here today? 
that God is saying to you, come, this is your day, this is your moment, this is your time. Your opportunity to say, God, I turn it over to you. I'm not going to try to figure it out on my own. I'm going to do it with you. The second part of this, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I give myself someone else is here God is speaking to your heart your heart may be pounding palms may be sweaty that's God saying it's your moment and he's looking for you to just simply say yes yes God I'll accept the gift that you offer me the gift of salvation through your son Jesus Christ the opportunity to have life and new life abundantly and to have the promise of eternal life would you come today Secondly, if you hear you say, I made a decision at some point, and, but I just slipped away. And I, and, but today, I want to affirm my confidence in the gospel message and surrender it all to him. I want to affirm my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel message. And I want to turn from where I am to begin following him. If that's you today, would you come? You say, man, you know, life hit me and I, I just became discouraged with my faith. But now, I want to surrender it all to the Lord Jesus. The third person that I'm looking for today is that person who says, I'm already walking with Jesus. Already love him. But I've been praying, I've been transitioning, I'm, I'm be between churches. And I know that it's God's will that I be in fellowship with other believers and be connected. And I just believe today that Amity Bible Church is that place that God has planted me here. If that's you today, then I say come. The person that says I'm already a believer, already love Jesus, but I want to make Amity Bible Church my church home. The doors of the church are swung open for you, that you may come and make that decision. So the person that says, hey, I'm making my decision to give my heart to Jesus. The person that says, I'm making the decision to affirm faith in him and to move from a backslidden place to a place of fellowship with him. And the third person that says, I just want to make this my church home, that I might be fed the word of God, be in fellowship with other believers, and have opportunities to serve and live out my faith in service to my Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Come on, let's give God a hand blessing, hand blessing for what he has done today. Three decisions, amen. Come on, come on, let's rejoice. Wait a minute, here's a fourth one. <laughs> come on, let's give God a hand blessing. Yes! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Yes! Yes! Yes, yes, yes! Hallelujah! We thank God. Thank God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Praise God. It's time to worship God in our giving. Amen. Thank you, God. Man, my heart is rejoicing to see God move like that. Hey, there's multiple ways to give. They'll share those with you in a moment, but I want to pray and give thanks. If you're here in person, there are envelopes in the pouch in front of you. Just reach in and fill one of those out if you have a physical gift. If you are giving online and other means, they'll, they'll explain that to you in just a moment. But I want to pray because the ushers will be coming in just a moment to give you an opportunity to give a physical gift if you have that today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your blessing upon us. Thank you for the time we've had in your word and the time that we've had together. Lord, we just pray today that you'd bless us indeed. And Father, we thank you that you've blessed us with, with what we have to give today because we know it all belongs to you, but you've entrusted some of it to us. Now we give it back to support your kingdom and your, work, your ministry here at Amity Bible Church. Use it for your glory and for your namesake. And Father, I ask you bless your people according to your word and their willingness to give according to that word. Use it now for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.
Good morning, Amity family. It's giving time. There are five ways that you can give to Amity Bible Church. One, you may visit the church website by going to amitybc.org backslash giving and clicking on the giving tab. You may also text to give by texting your dollar amount to 84321. You can also give via our Church Center app by clicking on Give. You may also send your donations by mail to 1601 West Buckingham Road, Richardson, Texas, 75081. You may also drop it in the offering baskets as the ushers now come. morning Amity family and guests thanks for being here with us today there's a lot of things happening at Amity and we wanted to take a moment to share some things coming up for you and your family ready let's get connected calling all men come out and fellowship with other brothers we will have a time of fellowship and have some home cooking by the chefs at Amity join us on April 20th the cost is ten dollars register today and get more details via the church center app are you wanting to become an Amity steward? Well, join us for new steward orientation on April 28th. You can register via the Connect Wall or via the Church Center app. It's been a great worship service. Stay connected during the week by visiting our website at amitybc.org or take us with you on the go via the Church Center app. Be sure you like and subscribe to our Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram at Amity Bible Church. Our prayer is that you have an amazing week and that God will meet you right where you are. Have a great week. Let's continue to make Him known. Yes, praise God, amen. Just rejoicing, rejoicing, rejoicing for what God is doing back there, amen. Praise God. Okay, any first-time visitors that we have, this is your first time worshiping with us today. You said, hey, hadn't been here before, here for the first time. Would you stand? First-time visitors? All right. Well, praise God. Amen. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. It is our delight to have you with us today. We pray that you've been blessed by your time with us, and we pray that you come see us again. But if you would bring that card with you after service to the Welcome Center in the lobby, my wife and I would love an opportunity to greet you personally and to thank you for being our guest today. God bless you. Come see us again soon. Amen? Second or third time visitors. Any second or third time visitors? Came, seen, came back to see again. All right. Praise. Amen. God bless you. And we pray that today you are blessed like you were before. And we hope you come see us again soon. But after service, if you would just stop by the information desk, they've got a little token to say thank you for coming back to see us. God bless you. We look to see you again. Amen. All right. Let's all stand. Oh, you know what? Hold on. Sit. Just for one moment. Just for one moment. So just, just for a minute. Give me a minute. So several of you, knowing how much me and my wife talk about cruises, have had approached us about, we ought to do a friends and family cruise here at Amity. Well, we got it set up. Stand up, Sister Bobby. Sister Bobby Alexander has put one together for the Amity friends and family. And so if you, if you are interested, 
go see her today. She's got information cards that will give you information. It's going to be next year, but you can get started. She set it up so you can start piece of, you can put a payment plan together, put your down payment deposit, and get you going. Amen? And many friends and family. Cruise 2025. All right. God bless you. Now you can stand. Praise God. All right. Let's go. Now may the grace of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ, may His grace rest, rule, and abide with us both now and forever. If you agree, please say amen. amen. God bless you. Go in His grace. Have an awesome week. And that's going to wrap up another incredible word. And we want to thank you for visiting Amity Bible Church. If you're in need of prayer or counsel, just speak to one of our friendly ushers and they can assist you. If you would like to join, receive these and other sermon notes, or attend our Wednesday night Bible study at 630, online or in person, visit us at amitybc.org. Until next week, be blessed. <laughs>